Debbie Corrigan, and I'm the wheeling MC tonight. <laughs> um, usually Ange does it, but as you can see, Ange is actually busy this evening. Um, so welcome. Um, we hope that you're going to enjoy this slightly different format this evening. So what we're going to do this evening is we've got lots of people here, and what we've got is we've got a Monash academic uh, facilitating conversations with lots of practitioners. So less about the academic talk and more about what's really happening. And I think that's going to be a fantastic um, format for us to explore. And I suppose I'll just flag it, you know, we're looking for feedback because we're, we will be doing more um, next year. We're hoping to increase the practitioner voice, the student voice in, in um, these, this series next year. So if you've got some feedback, we'd love to hear about it. But this evening, we've got uh, three different groups facilitated, as I said, by a Monash academic. And they'll have about 15 minutes uh, each, and they're going to answer some questions. And at the end of that, you won't hear much from me until I run around with a microphone at the end. So after they've given their presentations, we'll ask for you to have questions, and there's online as well, so it's streaming, so there hopefully will be some online questions. So I want you to think about the questions as you're going through. Right? So jot them down, make sure that you actually have some questions because this is actually what makes it um, all that more rewarding for everybody. So without further ado, I'm going to start the first one up. And so the, I have to put my glasses on because I'm really old. So, uh, Cathy Smith is a senior lecturer at Monash uh, and uh, all highly valued colleagues here this evening. Um, so, Cathy is going to facilitate the first group and the practitioners that Cathy has with her are uh, Alexandra Oglock, who's a classroom teacher at St Joseph's Primary School Hawthorne. Thank you. <laughs> Jordan Whittington, who's a level one and two teacher and a STEM leader at Scoresbury Primary School and Heather Ablett, who is the Head of Primary School here at the Knox School. Okay, so welcome, and Kat, over to you. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and also welcome to all our people who are joining us online tonight. Um, I think it would be really remiss to start the evening with an assumption that we all have a shared understanding of what STEM education actually means. And so that's how I'd like to start our discussion in our first group tonight, uh, to draw on your experience and thinking about, you know, what does STEM education actually mean to you? So, Heather, I'd like to start with you. As a leader of the junior school here at Knox School um, in primary education, what does STEM education mean to you? Well, I think um, for all of us, STEM has uh, risen probably over the last few years, as an opportunity for us to um, integrate the science, technology, um, engineering, maths, we actually add the arts in there too at uh, the Knox School. But STEM education is highly motivating for the students, where they have opportunity to collaborate, to work together, to solve problems, to be creative, and uh, these are really important skills for the future uh, for our students. They have to um, work to a, a reach a goal, um, and that collaboration is something that I think is really important in, in all education, and STEM is a great um, avenue for that. Jordan, you've been teaching for a couple of years now, and you've um, been lucky enough to be given the role of STEM leader at Scoresby Primary School. So what does STEM education mean to you? Well, I think STEM education is something that's so vital to all of our students. Um, science is everywhere, technology is always changing, Engineering is uh, bridges, houses, and things like that. And then maths is in every task that we do as well. So I think it's important to educate our students to get them to develop, develop a passion for STEM because that will lead them towards um, potentially jobs that don't even exist yet and give them the opportunity to be able to do those as well. And Alex, as a grade one classroom teacher, you're sitting right down in the junior end of the primary school. What does STEM education mean to you? I think that Heather and Jordan have really well covered the way that STEM is engaging for students 
and that the skills that they're learning are really important for their future. But um, I, I think that what I've learned in particular in the last two years of teaching is that STEM isn't this big, scary, um, you know, way that we integrate everything and, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be robots, it doesn't have to be really fancy technology, it can be something simple like um, putting blocks together, you know, that's making a design, yeah. I'd like to pick up on that in a moment about the opportunities that you think STEM presents for your students, but, you know, you, you've actually expressed a pretty shared understanding of STEM education, so I invite any of you to um, give a response to this question. What would you say to a teacher who says, well, look, I've been teaching maths, you know, I teach it all the time, I have to teach maths. I've been teaching science, I teach technology. So what's the difference with STEM education? What's the new about It's all related. <laughs> you can do it all together. Like science leads with maths, and you can just bring it all together and give really meaningful experiences for the students. So I'll give an example, maybe. Um, we've been um, undergo undergoing a little project um, here at the Knox School with um, some of our year sixes who have been working collaboratively um, with a group of um, honours students, a bit of a partnership we have with um, another institution. And we have um, designed our, a room that we're calling our um, science and technology room. The Year 6s have actually been designing the furniture that we're having built to put in that room. And so they've been looking at um, what to use, how to use, how the room's going to be used, um, the different ages of the students that will be accessing that room. That's bringing in technology, it's bringing in problem solving, it's bringing in um, mathematics, project like that, you know, it's a really rich task. Um, those are the sorts of things that um, STEM really lends itself towards. And so they're doing lots of all those subjects, maths and, and so on, within um, that project. So I then guess that leads us on to the question, which that's a beautiful example for the next question, I think, about how does STEM education provide you as a teacher um, with opportunities to enhance student For example, I'll give an example similar to that. Um, our year five, six, two, four, five, six students have been working with an outside organisation um, where they provided uh, kits for the students to use to solve a problem, to solve a problem to do with um, collecting objects off the floor, and they had to plan, design it, um, and create it, and then evaluate it at the end. Um, and that was really quite meaningful because it wasn't just we're doing this. It was actually, we had a reason why we were doing it and it was really quite meaningful for the students and really purposeful. So do you think that notion of authenticity or, or having a sense of purpose is important for student learning? Absolutely. I think starting a unit with something that really relates to the students is quite meaningful and it actually makes them more engaged. Um, with my one-twos we're doing at the moment, we're designing a park um, for our local area, um, which they've actually found quite fascinating because they're I would really like this, or we don't have this, and this is something that I really like. So um, I think definitely having it as a real life experience makes it really engaging for them. Alex, what about you? How do you think STEM education provides opportunities to enhance your students? Um, I'd like to stick with the examples. It's just been a trend. Uh, earlier in the year, we were working, um, actually we were doing a history unit, and we were mainly focusing on past and present. And what it turned into was um, a way that I wanted to engage the students with the concept was by showing them pictures of the kitchen from the 1900s and my own kitchen, but with plastic absolutely everywhere, all over the kitchen. And I even, it was a learning experience for me how much plastic I could find. And it was interesting to see, you know, their thoughts. A lot of them said, oh, well, that's a grandma's kitchen and that's someone's kitchen today. But what came from it was they were really interested in plastic and they were really interested in the effect. It, you know, it, it sort of, we followed their um, interest and they were, they became quite concerned about plastic in the world and what are we gonna do to solve the problem? One of my boys found a penguin on the beach with a water bottle in his mouth 
and he was, they were all beside themselves. So we had to try and solve the problem. And um, we ended up, at the same time, they were indicating that they wanted to do some building. So I think another thing about STEM is we can be creative about the way that we tie in different things from the curriculum and see where we can make links. So I was able to give them a project where they were repurposing plastic. So they were taking single-use items and giving them a purpose. So we all sort of looked at different ideas online and we just came up with, um, we voted on two different things they mainly wanted to make. And one was a watering can and the other was a pencil holder. And so um, the process turned into, you know, this. In, they were engaged the whole way through and we said that they couldn't actually touch the items or start to build anything until they had planned it and showed me that they knew all the materials that they would need. And in that way, they really closely followed their plans and their designs. And they came up with some, well, you'll see the photos up on the slides. They're not very aesthetically pleasing, but that's, that wasn't the point. The point was they've come up, they've used trial and error, they've built their design skills, um, and they came up with functioning items, and they felt a you know, success because they had somehow solved the problem. However, the parents weren't crazy about it, but that's another story. <laughs> now, I remember that image quite well because we were working uh, together around about that time. Do you think that that unit required you to think and work differently as a teacher because you found STEM in that unit? Um, I think the best thing about that unit was that it was quite organic. So I was never really you know, aware of what I was doing until I reflected later. It all came quite naturally that these different areas were interlinking. So what I'd like to just explore a little bit now before we finish up with our first group is the notion of leadership in STEM and the sort of support that teachers are expressing, you know, that they need in STEM education. So Jordan, you've um, been in leadership positions in STEM. What's your thinking around that? What sort of leadership do teachers need? What sort of support do they need in STEM education? I think first and foremost, we need good leadership from the top down. So our principals and our assistant principals and having their support and making it a real focus within the school. I'm very lucky to work at a school where they do believe that it is a focus and we've got an allocated time and room and funding for that um, to be able to provide that for our students. And looking into research as well and it being a, a collaborative approach and looking at personal development and for the, all teachers as well to have a collective understanding of what STEM actually is because what we found at our school in particular before we worked with you Kathy was that we all had these individual understandings of what STEM was and when we broke it down it was a lot easier to comprehend and um, that sort of just came from leadership you know working that way through and then supporting the staff to be able to teach it more effectively. And Alex, as a classroom teacher, what sort of support do you feel you need? I think that something that I really benefit from is regular planning with my team. We really bounce off each other well and dialogue with other teachers and we have dialogue with Kathy Smith two times a term at my school, so we're very fortunate to do that. Um, but I think another important thing is just remembering that as teachers we're still learners ourselves and so we're very lucky because we have a really competent STEM leader at our school and she um, facilitates, she'll be there in a heartbeat if we have any questions. Um, but also, you know, regular PLTs where we have an opportunity to build our own knowledge and skills. And Hina, as a leader generally um, across your primary school, what do you think teachers need in terms of support for STEM? Well, in a school, at our school, certainly we have a diverse range of teachers, um, some that are quite experienced um, and others that are uh, the new generation, if you like. And um, when we have, uh, you know, talked about having a focus on STEM um, the last year, um, the first thing that we, we, we did as a staff is talk about the things that they needed. They all wanted um, professional learning. It was really, really important for them. Um, I think it's important, too, to have a couple of... Um, Champions for the for the subject. We don't have a special STEM uh, leader in our in our school, um, but we have a couple of 
champions who are really up there and looking at new ways of doing things and sharing their knowledge and um, access, you know, sharing things on Pinterest and a whole range of range of different things. Um, that's really important. For me as a leader, um, I was very keen to, I guess, let them know that we were there to support them with resourcing. So we're able to um, get a room, set the room up, buy the resources. I didn't want my staff to have to go fossicking around, trying to find resources for a lesson, um, you know, and then, you know, they don't, don't have everything they need. We want them to be able to go to that room and know that they've got the resources <coughs> to use for um, whatever task. So there's, you know, there's, you know, consuming the materials and, and the sites <coughs> and, you know, a whole range of things in that room. That was really important um, for them. And they want time. They want time to collaborate. Um, we have shared collaboration which I think is really important, not just at STEM, but for a whole range of things. Um, we have a working group that is focused on STEM. So we sort of put in a structure around um, the staff <coughs> so that they can get confident. But some of them are really not confident at all, but they're relying on their colleagues and, and talking with their colleagues and having a go, you know, often with new things. They just need to play for a while, play in the space. Um, you know, we've had, you know, different professional learning opportunities where they just tinker with the materials just to get confident and um, that's working really well for us. So we're, you know, we're in the early stages really, um, but um, making good progress. I think that's a, a theme for most schools that I've visited recently is that everyone is just starting to play in the space and find their way. Uh, and I think that permission to have a go and take a few risks is probably a really important message. Could I get you to thank my three guests tonight. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to another colleague of mine, um, Jen Mansfield, who is uh, going to open a discussion about the sort of support that outside organisations can provide for teachers in schools. So, um, Jen, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to warn you that I recently found out that Jacqueline actually works at the zoo on the weekend, so everything I'm going to say can be a lie, but I'm going to pick up on that. Um, I, I think picking up on some of the themes that I've heard from the previous presenters around collaboration, I think is probably one of the main um, opportunities that the zoo can offer the schools um, in, the, in the STEM space. I often talk to teachers about STEM being anything um, to a certain degree but we've found it um, yeah, really a great opportunity to try um, uh, collaboration with schools on projects that we don't always have the time and space to, to solve um, and in doing so we, we found we provide a real purpose for education and what I mean by that, a good example um, of that is an eastern bar band an animal that people have often never heard of a local Victorian species that's extinct in the wild um, we have bred this particular species for a number of years now and one of the biggest problems we have is radio tracking them. And the reason why is because a radio tracker around their, their neck um, can be dangerous and their feet get caught but also over different seasons um, their neck expands and shrinks depending on the food that's available. And schools have come to us recently and said we'd actually like to try and design a, a, a radio tracker that would fit and expand and if an animal's foot gets caught in it, will break so that it doesn't actually strangle the animal. And they're doing that in their, their dedicated STEM classroom using 3D printing um, to create these, um, these sorts of things and solve these problems that we, we 
had one going um, with some of these animals. Another example, and you'll see in some of these photos that are on just a moment, I'll just use this as an example. Um, it's a, a box that houses a corroboree frog. And a corroboree frog is a tiny little frog about the size of your thumb that's critically endangered. And one of the biggest problems for that animal, besides the, the fungus that's killing it, is um, that people don't know enough about this animal or know this animal. And the only way that we can really get people who know these animals is by getting it in front of them. But you can't take a corroboree frog out and about like you can green tree frogs that we uh, have done for many years because they require particular um, conditions. So we've had um, keepers working with students to design eskies that are created into um, microhabitats for these frogs. So for up to about two hours now, they can go out and about in the zoo and meet students as well and uh, meet the public and get them to fall in love. So um, without going on too much because um, there might be other things I can talk about later, but I think that idea of collaborating with schools for an authentic purpose is probably one of the best things that um, we're able to provide. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Jim. Jacob, what about style in the online space? What sort of opportunities does STEM education provide for you? Sure. Um, first of all, I can vouch for me and everything that is correct. If only we actually just met for the first time. No, we've both been at the zoo for a very long time, but Ben's there during the week, I'm here on weekends, and we've never actually crossed us. But he's, he's legit. <laughs> um, so I might just quickly start by talking about what style is sure. in that segment. We're not quite a home owner's zoo. Um, <laughs> so what we do is we create online interactive resources for years five to 10. Um, so in the online space, um, and basically the way we approach our grade five to six units of work is they are um, inquiry-based integrated STEM units that cover the entire science curriculum, but also bring in um, design and technology and mathematics and any other curriculum area that's relevant. So that's, that's what we do. Um, do you have an example from those units? Could you maybe take us through one of those? Yeah. Um, so, so we've got nine different units in total. Um, and so, for example, we have a unit of work around adaptations. Um, and in that unit of work, um, the way we approach building this resource, if you like, is um, so I was brought on board about two years ago to, to build our resource to assist teachers to help enhance STEM education. That was essentially the, the guiding question behind our whole project was what can we do to help teachers? Um, and when we, we looked at that, it was about um, what are the biggest barriers to, to teachers? And the three things that are really, I suppose, or four things, is like confidence, um, and then time, resources, and money. Those are the biggest barriers. And those are the things that we, yeah, we heard it again tonight. Um, you know, I experienced myself as a, a primary school teacher trying to teach them um, the, the constant barriers. And so as a an online resource, we can actually help remove a whole lot of those barriers. Um, so for example, with our unit of work around adaptations, um, the, the, one of the things we can do in that is we've created a, a virtual reality experience where we can take students um, all around the world to every different biome in the world. Um, you can take kids to the Sahara Desert, you can take them through a dive in the Great Barrier Reef, um, and you don't need a permission to sleep or a, a risk assessment or any of those sort of things. Um, and so there's real opportunities to exploit technology to bring those sort of resources and um, experience to students that wouldn't otherwise have access to them. So it's about providing that accessibility to everyone through the way we create our resources. And you also act as a bit of a bridge between outside organisations like CSIRO and, and Cosmos as well. You link with those and I suppose that then also provides that, you know, that conduit between the, the CSIRO organisation and teachers. Yeah, very much so. So we wanted to think about how we could bring those resources um, into every single classroom. Um, and so we partnered with the CSIRO to build out this unit of work, and in particular their um, Double Helix magazine. Um, they've got a fantastic age-appropriate um, science resource that we can tap into, so we've integrated that throughout the units. Um, we've also integrated career profiles into all the units, so you might see a photo pop up in a moment. Um, that's an example of one of our career profiles. Her name's Carly Noon. She's an Indigenous astronomer. Um, she's young, she's fun, she's got blue hair, she's breaking all the stereotypes. Oh, she's a <laughs> <she's laughs> profile from the ABC. Yeah, um, she's an incredible person and was really great to help us out. Um, but it's about being able to bring you know, those people and those experiences into a classroom, even without having to, to leave the classroom, basically. So basically breaking down any of those barriers that are there providing accessibility for everyone. And also creating that awareness too, 
as you said, which is similar to your corroboree from getting it out there and actually having it in space where people can access and become more aware as well. So just before we finish up, is there anything else you'd like to share about in particular how schools might connect with you in this space? Is there any particular how, how do you, what will teachers do to go about forming partnership with you as Victorian, for example? Yeah, look, I get this question um, quite a lot and um, it isn't necessarily
um, you know, things that we could only once dream about are now are now possible. Um, and so we're going out to schools and teachers and, and holding workshops and saying, what, what do you want us to do for you? Like, what can we possibly create um, for you to help make your life easier? Um, so, for example, with assessment, um, obviously we can exploit technology to, to take away all that marking um, and that side of things. Sure, teachers will love that. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, but it's not just not just that time, it's also actually just providing teachers with that real-time analytics and feedback that was never before really a possibility and that ultimately leads to, to better teaching and learning experiences. And sure, and feedback too for the students as well because they're getting feedback on their progress and they're knowing sort of giving that self-reflective as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and just looking at what we can do to give that time back to teachers so they can stop focusing on the, the what and spending all their time doing that but more about the how and, and focusing on that differentiation and creating those inspiring learning experiences. Um, so that's ultimately what we're working with schools to do. Fantastic support. Thank you very much. Could you please join me in thanking Ben? <laughs> um, next, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Angela Fitzgerald, who will be chatting um, about opportunities for sharing their experiences. Thanks, Jen. I think it's official. I'm a step nerd. I've been like, ooh, ah, ooh, all through those things that you've been sharing. So really great start for us. So I'm lucky enough to be sitting here with Shelley Wilden, who is Project Manager in Science and Innovation at Catholic Ed Melbourne, and Lucas Jackson, who, Johnson, I knew I was going to do that, but don't say Jackson, or Johnson, um, who's a STEM leader and um, classroom teacher at St. James's in Brighton. Just so glad I got that right. Um, so thanks for both joining us tonight. And I guess I was really thinking about you both today, and I'm thinking, wow, on paper, I guess you like you're from two really different worlds. And so what connects you both? And I was thinking a bit more deeply and I thought, well, you're leaders, which is fabulous. We've got a lot of leaders with us here and in the audience. But you guys are opportunity makers and you provide chances for people to come together locally or on a larger scale, Shelley and I mean, teachers and students to really use STEM as a vehicle or as Ben said, STEM as a license to really think about building expertise and experience and professional learning. So Ross, we're going to be really looking forward to hearing a bit more from you both around that. But to kick us off, Lucas has got a little video, which we'll show you now. Oh, cute video. Um, that will kind of get us talking about the kind of things we do to be those opportunity providers, which I think is really exciting. For the students to be involved in STEM learning is an amazing thing. And Often schools work in silos and work independently, so for the students to have an opportunity to come down here, share their learning with a range of other schools, I think it's a brilliant opportunity. And we're really making sure that today is all about the students and they have a great time, they're all excited about what they're sharing, and as you, this passion around here is amazing that we're seeing so far. They can actually make change to make sure it's a better world within our Catholic context as well. I think that's important because um, as a Catholic sector, we must have a strong impact in ensuring we have good kids, well formed, with a great social conscious. The most interesting thing I've seen today is the virtual reality lab, because I really am into VR and all that sort of thing. I think it's pretty cool that we get to meet all the different students from other schools and we get to see what they're up to. We have a wonderful day here with eight, nine different Catholic schools across the Southern Zone. They're really uh, enjoying each other's company and celebrating their learning about what they've learned in STEM. Presenting what we've been working on for quite a long time because it just proves that like, what we've done is quite amazing, well I think it is, and it's really cool what we've done. So what you see in the video there is a um, day that we call the Stamps of Front. So earlier this year I went to my principal Brendan who you saw there and we talked about the fact that there's um, not many opportunities for schools to come together and share their learning. We also noticed that if you talk to schools individually, there's great things happening inside those schools, but we're just not sharing it and giving our students the opportunity to come together and, to, and learn from other students. So we planted that this day called the Stamps of Front and we invited Well, 
the students. And then for two hours we had an EXO format where students shared projects that they'd been working on throughout the year. So what you saw in the project were real life problems that students had approached and all of them looked very different. Um, and we saw students from year one up to year six and all of them shared the, the thing that we most noticed in common was the passion they had for their learning. That they were so keen to for all of the judges come over and all of the people who came through the expo so that they could chat to the judges or to the people about their projects and share what they were passionate about. So I think the fact that they were passionate about their topics really allowed them to bring out those pretty cool and creative thinking skills um, and share that with a wider audience. Yeah. I think it's really great. We're lucky enough to have Shelley and Kathy there on the day as our judges as well. Fantastic. So I'm wondering, um, so as we've just sort of spoken about the value for the students and their learning there, what do you see as the value for teachers and building their expertise in STEM education through a day like that? In the build-up, it was really hard to get teachers on board, and I think we've heard a lot about teacher confidence in STEM as well. Um, I spoke to a lot of teachers who weren't sure that what they were doing at their school was good enough, I guess, for the day, um, and you just had to really reinforce with them that it's about the learning journey for our students, and when they come with a great looking final product or not, it doesn't matter. If they can explain their mistakes that they made throughout the process and, and what they came across, that's more powerful than learning. I think that they, the school that actually won on the day were the school that could quite clearly communicate that. Um, and I think that's what got them over the line. Isn't that fantastic building such excellent skills and real capability with it? Jelly, what have you been thinking and what um, sorts of things have you been up to that might help us understand the kinds of opportunities you create in your work? So I work with sector level for 330 schools in the Archdiocese of Melbourne. And that's supporting primary schools and secondary schools. Uh, STEM education, and we go definitely with that definition from the chief scientist and from the national schools um, STEM school strategy, which is a 10-year strategy. Isn't that amazing? The government getting behind anything for more than 10 minutes, a 10-year <laughs> strategy. So part of what we've been doing is to help schools understand this is important, it's not a fad, can't deny it, and it's not something that happens on the side. And so we've been trying to develop at a sector level professional learning opportunities and all sorts of support. So some of that support from organisations like the zoo that help us help those schools. So we've broken lots of that support. The types of um, professional learning we've been engaged with is going beyond that professional development, that one day experience where you get a few cool activities and you go back to school, but that's it, not tick the box and now I don't have to go anywhere with it. We've been trying to shift that into professional learning and into action research and as Hattie says, that sort of inquiry into teachers' professional practice. And yeah, so we, yeah, we put together a uh, project and like Lucas, lots of people apply or don't apply and then you sort of knock them back and go, well, are you ready for this game or not? And we decided to switch it all around. There's so much in that work on the skills that is not actually about the content. So when we ask teachers and students and families what you hoped for for their students, nobody said we want them to be able to derive the quadratic from first principles. What? I'm like... <laughs> But that's an awesome task if you're going to be an engineer. And as um, I think the girl said before, science is everywhere, STEM is everywhere. It's getting people to make a mind shift in that space. So we offer the project through the capabilities. We've got to address the capabilities in the new Victorian curriculum. We map the capabilities. And we found that pretty much all the skills in STEM sit beautifully under the critical and creative thinking. And all of that dispositional, attitudinal, collaborative work and all that stuff that employers want these days rather than some expertise, that sits under the personal and social capability. And of course, we're asking Catholic schools and all the schools really, that ethical capability, that justice and the common good are really important. So with that mind shift, we produce this project and it's been a long year in action research with some schools. It's been
been a really big challenge and we wondered how on earth people were going to make the shift. Because a lot of them said, just a few weeks ago, when we first bought into this project, we thought it was going to be about robotics and you're going to teach us how to do robotics really well and incorporate them in the classroom. And it turned out not to be that at all. We shifted it around and in the project, teachers were challenged to have experiences to transform themselves as learners. So once we see ourselves as learners, asking teachers to do what they're asking the kids to do, having that growth mindset, which helps you develop those skills to use the tools. The toolkit's no good at all without the skill set, and the skill set needs that attitude and the mindset. So that's really what we've been doing. We've been having some really interesting results. That's great. Right. Just before yeah, you yeah, no. go on, I'm sure you've got some really interesting slides to share. But one of the questions that came through my head, Shelley, is what was the project? Well, you, know, you gave a little hint there that it was about robotics, but it became much more than that. What, what was the sum? Well, it wasn't about robotics. <laughs> that's, what, that's what people wanted. And I'll have to put some robotics in next year because I really just need to do that. But it was about getting people to that point, which many of we, we had heard people talking about that. It's not just about digital technology. Mm -hmm. Digital technologies are an awesome tool, but that's the T. Mm -hmm. It's that multidisciplinary approach. And it's for teachers to see it doesn't matter if you're doing geography or history. Can you see the STEM skills and the attitudes sitting in that? So getting teachers to look at whatever inquiry unit they were doing early in the year and trying to map the skills on that. Are you seeing that you're already doing it? It was like a real revelation for teachers. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm really interested to hear from Lucas mm -hmm. as well about what I'm hearing here, Shelley, is that you're creating conditions for people to be able to engage in STEM and we've heard across the board here that it's daunting and that you know we're all going <coughs>
confidence in their content knowledge. Private teachers are really great at doing good multidisciplinary inquiries. As Lucas was saying, as long as it's called out, as long as it's made explicit. So for our primary schools, it was helping them understand that if you make this explicit, if you look at what you're already doing and you start tracking this stuff, you're not starting from the ground up. You're starting quite a long way up. You just need to bring your mind, mind into that place. For our secondary schools, it's been much more challenging for them because they've actually got to find a way to get timetabling in to share some sort of um, opportunity. And that's been awesome. We've got some schools that have been successful in that space, yeah. but it's a real challenge for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just finally, I'm really interested, Lucas, one of the fantastic things about what you've been doing in the space is bringing students along. So, you know, how, I imagine it easy, but you know, how have you imagined, or how have you achieved that, I guess? Um, I think the students, as you said, it, it's easy. As soon as you say to them, we're, we're going to do a STEM activity, they, they get that excitement. Um, they have the lucky job of uh, walking to another classroom and the kids sort of get the excitement because they know it's going to be something, yeah, whether it's um, you know, doing something on the STEM you know, engineering side of things or the robotics. And I think um, the challenge is with the students. I think the challenge is getting the teachers right. So, and as primary teachers, we often don't come from a science background, and that's where I think the lack of confidence might come from. Um, whereas if you look at the secondary level, obviously we have those secondary science teachers. So um, I think if we can build that confidence within the teachers to, to take it on. And when you, you look at it, it's not pure science content, it's, it's the science inquiry skills that we, we should be teaching our students anyway. Absolutely. I'm going to leave it there. We're going to turn over to the audience. But please join me in thanking Shelley and Lisa.
I'm going to jump in there with a few examples. So what we've found is that when we offer really awesome STEM projects for the secondary schools, they're having to find ways to manage that. And so some are doing it just as, we'll do it as the little gifted program or the, the code club or something at lunchtime with interested students or those high achievers or those that need extensions. Some are actually jumping in and going, we're going to do a whole elective and it's going to have all of these people involved in it. That's really difficult for them to do that. But for those schools that are interested and are making that leap, they're doing that. Some are going, the whole of year eight is going to do this amazing project in science, but it's going to actually be STEM related. One of the really good news stories I have is we've got one of our girls' schools, and for many years, they've been having six to nine girls take VCE in physics. And they introduced three years ago a STEM program with a different project every year for the girls. And it was really difficult, but the school found it so important that they timetabled it. And so the science team gave up an hour a week, or the maths team gave up an hour a week, and the art team gave up an hour a week, and they put together this STEAM program in a maker space. And what they've been doing, so that's the last three years, this year for the first time they've got 22 girls taking VCE physics. Now that is a 200% shift and really based on that transformation. I don't know how they're going to go, but we've got a whole lot more girls who are feeling confident at least in jumping into that space. And so the evidence is in that when the schools make that effort, they can do that. But you're right as well. Those who have already got really great skills in VCE and everything, if you're already on a great end game, you don't necessarily want to change it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We've got schools like that as well. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks, Jackie. We're, um, we're going to throw to an online question because we've got folks streaming along at home. So what have we got there, Chantal? Okay, so we've got a question from Vesna. And she's asking, what impact have you noticed about student growth in other curriculum areas? So, for example, English as a result of STEM and collective teacher efficiency. Vesna, thank you. So we're back to the panel. <laughs> Alex, have you got something, some thoughts there? <laughs> um, oh, I think, yeah, so as I mentioned before, we talk about the um, passion that comes with learning in STEM, and I think if you can um, get students passionate about a topic, then they're more likely to be keen to write about that particular topic. So if you can um, centre your, your writing, whether it's um, informative writing, or persuasive writing around that topic that the students are engaged in at the time, then you're more likely to have that greater engagement, whether it's in their writing or whether it's in reading text in relation to that topic, um, research skills as well. So I think that um, it really opens up the, the doors of English there as well. I think also it um, gives great opportunity for children to take action and we've certainly noticed that, that when they're very passionate about a project, um, they will then um, be self-motivated to go and follow that up and come back with new ideas of how to change the world. You know, primary students are um, very good at that. And so if they've had a, a project about you know, recycling or whatever, and they start looking at ways that we can improve the school or we can improve at home, and we do get reports from parents about you know, students demanding that lights get turned off and a whole range of different so I think the action is something that's uh, quite noticeable when you're passionate about um, um, learning in STEM. Thanks, Esther. Thanks, everyone. We might throw back to the audience and then we'll come back for an online question. I just wanted to ask, we're still in the inquiry model and I spoke to Cathy at the start of the year about we wanting to get into this program and I think for some reason we didn't. I'm from St. Paul, of course, from South. Indigo Hills. And uh, so we're still in the inquiry model. Now, would you do the taking action before building the field? Is, is that where the STEM is going? So you get on with taking action because by the time we finish off with the unit, it's 
time out. You've got to wrap up the unit. So would you start off with taking action first and then build on to the unit? Or how do you do it? The question about the action. I, what we noticed most about the taking action is actually after the unit. It's what continues on. The learning continues even after that um, unit of inquiry has been finished within the classroom. It's the action after that I think is um, quite powerful. Okay. Does that answer your question? No, like we do a two-year cycle. With, with, with our inquiry, we've got a two-year cycle. So every term, we're picking up a new topic to cover all the curriculum. So in 10 weeks, you can only cover, you know, you've got to give them knowledge, the formal knowledge that everybody needs to have with the whole topic. And then you want them to take action. So we've noticed, with our, even with our RE planner, we've got the taking action bit in the end, with our inquiry planner, taking action. But we never get onto it. So by the time it's time to get onto it, it's time to go. How do we do it? How do we, like, where do we start from? We're still in the inquiry model. Where do we start off from? I think um, Sven really lends itself well to the inquiry model. Um, I think I like to think of it as the design process a lot. So if you can get into the design process quite early, go through the idea of posing questions, um, finding the research, developing solutions. Um, they don't always have to drop you in it, but I will sort of, um, is I think the zoo is really doing some fantastic work in that space and that the action's coming really early and it's sort of inspiring and empowering our um, kids to want to learn more. So I wonder if you've got something to add around that. Um, well, probably, so Shelley and I um, worked on a number of different projects and one recently that we um, worked with, a, it was actually with the Year 10 group, um, but it was problem around some of our, again, some of our local native species that are really well um, unknown to so many Victorians. And so the problem that we pose this year 10 group is how do you get Victorians to love their local animals? And that was, and the, um, the problem that had to be solved was, uh, we, you know, we set in this challenge, sorry, of in seven weeks we want you to come back and we're going to turn the zoo over to you and you're going to get Victorians to love Animals. The visitors that come past are going to engage in, with these animals. And the students have to design puppets of particular animals. And they are in groups given um, relatively unknown animals, like I mentioned the boys and bad bandicoots, robbery frogs, um, planes wanderers, lots of animals that people have never heard of. And the action that took place while well, at the 
Mandy culminated in that particular day where they came back to the zoo and presented to um, the visitors that came to the zoo that day. The action actually happened throughout the program because every day they were redesigning these puppets to make sure that they, they mimic the um, movement of those particular animals and they took on the key characteristics of those animals. Some of the students made the calls of those particular animals, but it was in the testing of those animals that the real action was. It wasn't just at the end in that, that big event, but it was actually the continual testing and refinement of those particular puppets that they were creating and the questions that they were um, sending me and my team about the animals, things that we didn't even know about these animals, and we had to go anyway and ask the researchers. But that in itself was, you know, that's the action, not necessarily just that end result. And some of the puppets at the end we thought, seven weeks worth of work into that. Is that what we came up with? But when we looked at it in retrospect, it's actually, well, actually the thinking and the uh, work behind it, that was the action that um, we were yeah, after and that the teachers were after as well. Great. Well, just, just, I just add yeah. in? Um, we've done lots of projects and it's about planning and it's not easy. So while we're saying that a lot of these skills are already inherent in our teachers, it's not easy. So we've done some things and I've asked teachers to plan differently. So as Kath was saying, if the action's important, you've got to plan for that. And that's my last two weeks of term. And if I need a whole lot of skills, then I've got to plan that explicit timing. And we had some projects and the teachers afterwards said, sure, that's the hardest thing I've ever had to do is take my thinking about planning and planning backward by design in a really critical way. And I said, so what are you gonna do? Are you gonna drop back into what you were more familiar with? And they went, no, I've seen the results with the kids. I've had my mind open to another way of teaching. I have to keep doing this and I just hope it gets easier as I get more experienced in it. It's not all that easy, but once you become experienced and once you see the passion in these kids and the amazing stuff that 11 year olds can do, you just can't go backwards. Thanks, Cheryl. I might go to uh, another online question. Thanks, Shanda. Okay, so we've got Gemma who works in a primary school and the school includes a science lab and a maker space room. So um, what she's asking, it, like it's been taught by different teachers currently, so she's asking how they can combine and work together. <laughs> I'd just like to say that this whole notion of specialist teachers in uh, primary education is an interesting area because we've said already that one of the greatest strengths I think of primary teachers is their capacity to integrate and, and link areas and yet we also know that confidence is something that is um, often a challenge for primary teachers. I often think a, a, almost like a co-teaching situation would work really well. There's, there is sometimes a view that if the specialist teacher is taking the subject, then I send the class and I go back and, you know, and sometimes things are set up that way, that that's your time release too, so it gets rather tricky. But there is potential here to do some co-teaching together to work alongside and almost mentor each other, build a, a classroom teacher's confidence, and also perhaps use the context of work that's going on in the classroom in terms of inquiry units uh, in the specialist work time. So there are other ways of thinking about it. I'm with you, Kath. I think we've heard across the panel tonight that there is that lack of confidence, and so you know, there's power in numbers, and you know, two brains are certainly better than one, so there's those opportunities, I think, Gemma, to co-teach and bounce off each other makes a lot of sense. Great, we'll throw over to the audience again for any questions. Okay, we might take one more then from um, online. Okay, we've got Jessica online, um, who is a graduate primary school teacher. So what are some suggestions or suggested resources um, that you have or you can recommend so she can delve into this do domain without finding it too overwhelming? It's a really good question. Um, being, this is my second year of teaching and one of the best resources that I've found is Monash University and the people who I met through that. Um, we'll find you later. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, so definitely my lecturers back at university. So I met Kathy through um, one of my lecturers who was in my final year, and she was my biggest supporter through everything. We would debrief after placements, and she would say, okay, what was this school doing? What can we do better? And coming out and asking for feedback. Um, and then when I was given the role of STEM coordinator at high school, the first person I thought of, I was like, okay, I'm going to email her and I'm going to talk to her and I'm going to see what idea she has that I can bring to my school. Um, and then when I spoke to leadership and I spoke to people at my school, we discussed all about having professional learning and I thought, okay, where am I going to go to get professional learning that's going to be meaningful to, for all of the staff at my school? And my first thought was Monash. So I went back and I spoke to my lecturer and she put me in touch with Kathy and it's been one of the best resources that I think has been quite valuable. Um, one of the other things that um, we've been quite lucky to at my school is collaborating with other organisations. So things outside of Zoos and Styles, but um, we've got a organisation in our local area which is around the corner that does um, science supplies. Um, and they do lots of work with um, different charities and organisations and other schools in the area and they've actually come in and supported us to provide uh, meaningful units for our five, six students. And I think by having other organisations, and we've also had charity groups, not charity groups, but like, um, like community organisations, like we've had robotics teams um, from our area coming in, sharing with us what they know and sharing their knowledge with our students and holding sessions with us as a staff. Um, that has given us that it's not so scary to be able to incorporate robotics into our classrooms. Because um, you think, oh, coding's scary, but then you look at what they're doing and what they're able to achieve and they're entering competitions, and then it's like, oh, that's okay, my kids can do that, you know? And it's, it's not scary once you get your foot in the door and you just, I, I gave the kids that I was working with the robotics kit that we had, and I said, okay, here's the instructions, build it. And they said, okay, that's fine. And I'm like, do you, do you know what you're doing? And they said, yeah, there's the instructions. We put it together and we'll, we'll follow the instructions and if we get stuck, we'll work together. And I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> like, and then the way that they were able to work out the program to actually code it themselves, and that just shows that by having one or two meaningful sessions with our robotics organised, the robotics group that we were working with, they were able to pick up those skills and then share those skills with the teachers, but also showing me that it, if they can do it, I can do it. So, you know, they're not scared, so why should we be scared of something of the unknown when it's just, yeah, we've got the supplies, we've got the resources, we've got the support, it's all out there, you've just got to know where to look. Um, I think to add to that, um, a couple of online resources for teachers new to STEM that can sort of dip their toe into the water, there's one called EngQuest, which gives a range of um, engineering problems. And they're targeted from prep all the way through to year six, and they're actually aligned. They're aligned to the Australian curriculum, but obviously you can still find them to the Victorian curriculum. But there's also Big STEM, uh, a website by the Victorian government um, that is, gives you a whole range of resources there as well. And I've, I've found myself, um, I'm new to the STEM leader role this year, and I'm actually on some um, professional learning networks on Twitter, and there's some great Twitter chats on there. There's actually one that runs on Thursday night chat, uh, I'd highly recommend getting on there. You don't have to actually contribute for the first few times, but you know, sit there and, and follow along, and, um, and you might find that you, you can contribute as you go. So I think that's really helpful, because the question online that we don't have time for, for I suppose, is that there's a primary teacher in a remote Western Australian community who's wondering how they can engage in this sort of stuff online. You know, so I think probably that's been particularly helpful. Um, so thank you very much for all of that. And I think probably, you know, also that whole notion of partnership. You know, we don't have to do it alone. So if we're trying to teach collaboration to kids, maybe we might start modelling that. I think it's probably a pretty good message, but anyway. Can I take, get you to take this opportunity to thank our panel for their input this evening? And 
And I'd also personally love to thank you all for coming along. Um, I think it's been fantastic. Hopefully you'll start to give us some feedback. So I think probably uh, we're trying to develop the notion that it is a collaborative venture. Monash University is actually part of what we uh, are about. And so we're looking to assist, we're looking to be part of that partnership. But more importantly, we also need to thank the people who very generously donate facilities and their time. And so I'd personally like to thank on behalf of us all, the Knox School for allowing us to actually stage this final STEM uh, uh, evening here. And I think it's really important that we continue to make the connections to schools. And so that's what we're looking to do as well. So sorry, you know, even though we're going into a brand new building at Monash, we still want to come out and, and do these things in the, in the uh, school communities and the local communities. So I'd just like to say thank you very much for your presentations and participation this year. And look out on the website for uh, what we've got exciting new plans for next year, but we're also happy to hear from you. So let us know what you'd like us to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.